Hello and welcome to Cell Culture Best Practices. The goal um, of this talk is really to just give you some ideas of some areas where I found maybe that people haven't uh, done, done the best job in cell culturing, uh, maybe where people can improve a little bit. And also I want to discuss uh, some things, some tips about freezing and thawing some cells and then talk a little bit about cell line verification because it's becoming a really important uh, topic. So I just want to point out that people can grow cells in small volumes and people can grow cells and scale up into larger volumes using, you know, New Brunswick or Innova or various different um, shaking platforms and so forth. So we can grow cells at small scale or large scale and generally uh, we can scale up cell cultures to certain levels, and then once we get by, get past these certain levels, scale up begins to be nonlinear. So just have that as an expectation. One of the other things I've found is that when people do protein expression experiments, uh, for example, and they're and they're interested in uh, oxygen transfer rates and so forth, which is really important in cell culture. One of the things people forget if they're scaling up or if they're comparing expression with one type of shaking platform to the other, uh, and that would be the length of the throw. In other words, the arm which rotates a platform. And, and oftentimes, for example, those Offsets might be something like a half inch or an inch or something like that. But if you look at this equation, the OTR, the transfer, oxygen transfer rate, um, is really, uh, uh, the, it, the, the basics is that the size of the orbit affects the oxygen transfer rate linearly and the speed of the orbit has a square law relationship. So in other words, if the orbit doubles, say, from a half an inch to one inch, then the oxygen rate should double. If you double the speed of the uh, shaking, uh, the oxygen transfer rate should quadruple. So the point is, is that I've seen people who have tried to scale up moving from one size flask or a shaker to the next only to find that things don't move linearly. And one of the reasons for this might be just something simple like the oxygen transfer rate uh, has been changed based on the uh, throw of your shaker. So that's something to keep in mind. I know we've talked before in these webinars about media, but do remember that there is a natural decay um, of unstable components in media, media, and that could be things like the glutamine, uh, that could be amino acids, vitamins, things like that. So that's really important to understand. And as, of course, things decay in the media, uh, toxic byproducts uh, increase as a result of the decay of certain unstable compounds. We want to maintain right the correct, correct pH, and this is often uh, inappropriately done because people don't often use the right amount of CO2 in the incubator for the amount of sodium bicarb that's in the media. And I just want to remind you that if you're in about the 2 grams per liter bicarb range, then you probably want to use 5% CO2. If you're up in the 3.5 to 3.7 uh, grams per liter sodium bicarb, you want to use about 10%. Remember that with the traditional formulations, you can go to the catalog and you can look up uh, the recipe for that particular uh, traditional media and you can determine the amount of sodium bicarb and therefore you can determine the amount of CO2 to use in your incubator. Remember that if you're using a proprietary media, normally uh, will tell you the amount of uh, CO2 to use in your incubator. Usually that's 8% for a lot of serum-free medias. Really important, don't freeze your serum, but once uh, multiple freeze thaws can affect some of the components in media. You never want to freeze your basal media. Uh, the bottle of DMEM or RPMI 1640, you would like to keep those refrigerated in the dark. Remember to protect your media from light, especially if it does not have phenol red. And I'd also ask you to minimize the time your media is at 37 degrees because remember there is that spontaneous decay um, and it increases with temperature. Again, I just want to remind you that light will damage your media. This is an experiment where uh, cell culture media without phenol red was exposed to light 
for half an hour, two and a quarter, four and a quarter, or six and a quarter hours, and you can see the spontaneous uh, reduction in growth potential of the media using sp2 cells. So uh, exposure to light will damage the growth potential of your media. So that's real important. Uh, keep media in a dark uh, 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 freezer. Don't expose. If you have lights or anything in your freezer, you should shut those lights off. You should put some aluminum foil over the glass uh, windows in your freezers if you have glass windows. In terms of freezing and thawing, I've noticed that a lot of people um, freeze correctly, but they don't really thaw correctly. So the recommendation is that we always freeze degree cells at one degree a minute. We freeze slowly. The idea then is we're allowing cells time before they're frozen to push water out of the cells in conjunction with the adjuvant that's in the freezing media. We're lowering the freezing point. We're giving the cells more time to push water out. This is why we always want to freeze cells slowly at about one degree a minute. When we thaw cells, most of the cell death occurs around minus 50 degrees centigrade, so we always want to make sure that we freeze cells as rapidly as possible at 37 degrees. And my recommendation there would be to move uh, some 37 degree water in a little cup right to the freezer, take your cells out of the freezer, immediately put them at 37 degrees, shake that uh, uh, frozen vial of cells, move the cells into a 37 degree water bath. Um, when all the ice is melted, remove your cells, spray with alcohol very, very well. I spray actually multiple times before you open up that vial. When you put your frozen cells into complete media or into the cell culture media, the media is best if it's pre-warmed. And I'd like you to add the cells, the thawed cells, very, very slowly. The idea is that the freezing media is imposing a higher osmotic pressure on the cells. The cells are being crushed a little bit. We transfer our frozen thawed cells into fresh media. We're lowering the osmotic pressure abruptly. We want to do that slowly, so we want to put the freezing media into fresh media very, very slowly. Allow the cells a couple of minutes um, to uh, acclimate before you centrifuge your cells. I also recommend using conditioned media. By definition, conditioned media is media that's been used to grow cells, but not enough so that all the nutritional value is removed. The idea there is every cell type will secrete unknown factors or factors into the media which other cells like. This is kind of the paracrine growth scenario. And so I make conditioned media by placing fresh media in a flask with maybe 20 to 30 percent confluent cells. Let the cells uh, grow overnight in media. The next morning I remove that media. I, ca I call that conditioned media. Um, I centrifuge to remove any cell debris, and I usually freeze that back. The reason I freeze that back uh, is because I want long-term storage. And I know I just told you you don't want to freeze cell culture media, but in this case, this is how I store it. Once it's thawed, I add 50% fresh, 50% conditioned media to my culture, and it can allow me to uh, overcome any uh, problems that I might have. I also know that freezing cells in conditioned media is a good way to go, especially if you're using a serum-free media. In that case, I might use 42 and a quarter percent fresh media, 42 and a quarter percent conditioned media, and seven and a half percent dimethyl sulfoxide if you wanted a good general freezing media. Um, and also, I want to just mention that because cells do uh, begin to die at the minus 50 degree transition uh, when you're thawing cells. I'd recommend when you take cells out, for example, to organize or inventory, you keep yourself, your cells on a styrofoam pad or something uh, on dry ice, something to keep those cells from thawing out while you're going through and inventorying uh, your frozen cells or your cell stocks. Okay, so make sure uh, that you don't allow those cells to, to get below minus 50 when you take them out of the freezer if your idea is to have them stay viable and to put them back in the freezer after something like inventorying your cells. 
So the important thing really to understand also is that when we grow cells, we select for cells that have a growth advantage, and those cells do win every time. The reason why I bring this up is because um, in addition to selection and some of the things we've talked about in other webinars, uh, this is one of the reasons why we have what we call cell line cross-contamination. And the idea is that people are thinking now that 30% or so of all the cells used out there have intra or interspecies cross-contamination. Uh, intraspecies would be something like you think you're dealing with a human lung cell when really what you have is a human kidney cell. An interspecies cross-contamination would be something like you're thinking you're using a human cell line when really what you're doing is using a monkey cell line, so different cross-species. Uh, because this is such a prevalent problem, monitoring is something that's really important and, and necessary but has been neglected. So the characteristics of cells are um, amiable for verification. And I will just tell you that people are very interested in cell line verification. And most of the journals are in agreement now, are in agreement now that uh, they will require some cell line validation or something like that in order to uh, have your, your data published. Uh, there's been too many times when people have not been using the cells that they believe they're using. So um, authentication of a cell line is the process by which a cell line's identity is verified, and the cells have also been shown to be free of uh, other cell lines or, or microbial or mycoplasmic contamination. There are standardized techniques that allow for this authentication, and it is, it is something that is really important and will ensure valid and re reproducible experimental results. ATTC is recommending now some basic uh, benchmark verification tests, which can employ, be employed in any lab. And these can include things like a morphologically, morphological check, growth curve analysis, uh, species verification, uh, tandem repeat analysis, and mycoplasma detection. And these things will be required if people want to public, publish in a good journal in the near future. So when you look at cells uh, under the microscope, you should do a morphological check. You want to refer uh, to uh, the microscope, and you want to make sure the cells look like they're supposed to look, right? They, um, uh, and you like to have photos for comparison uh, from one culture to the other. Remember, cells, the idea here is that a cell line can change over a long period of time, and if you're not observing and monitoring the morphology, you might not, not notice this. Um, so look at different confluencies, look at different shapes. Here in this image, we can see some baby hamster kidney cells that were grown at low and high confluency. And you can see that they look fairly different from one another. So low uh, density, high density photographs would be important. When Remember, when you have your cells growing at low density, that's the time to look morphologically for uh, cell problems, for contamination, and so forth. Here's another example. Uh, these are a pheochromocytoma. This is an adrenal carcinoma from a rat. Uh, the panel on the left, the cells are plated on just normal cell culture plastic. The panel on the right, the cells were plated on poly L lysine. The idea there is that the matrix that the cells are attached to can affect the morphology and can affect differentiation. So it's important to understand this and, and determine whether your cells are differentiating or remaining undifferentiated or having different behaviors when plated on different uh, cell culture matrices. Growth curve analysis is another really critical uh, a thing to do. I think most people don't do growth curves, but I, I believe it's really important. Uh, a growth curve should be consistent. A growth curve should be done for cells grown under whatever conditions you're growing them in the lab. If you look at the cell growth and the slope of the line, you can determine things like the cell doubling time. 
If you saw, for example, a premature stationary phase, that might be an indication that your cells need to be subcultured or something. A growth curve is really important, and I recommend doing a growth curve for every culture grown under every condition. And once in a while, go back and re-examine the growth curve and make sure that the slope of the line is the same. This will tell you whether your cells are changing uh, or whether growth conditions are affecting the way your cells grow. Um, small terminal repeat analysis, small tandem repeat analysis for DNA profiling may be another important tool. I'll just point out that there are a number, and this is mostly for human cell lines, but there are a number of databases out there, uh, the American type uh, culture collection, Japanese collection, German Resource Center for Biological Materials. These all have databases. Uh, where you can uh, gain information about your cell type and uh, looking at various cell types, primarily humans, uh, you, can, you can do some analysis to verify that your cell type is, is the type of cell you believe it is. Uh, so the idea there behind this is that most of the DNA in higher eukaryotes, of course, is non-coding. There's a significant part of a non-coding sequence that is uh, repetitive. There are many in microsatellites, uh, highly polymorphic zones within these non-coding regions, and we can learn uh, a lot about the cell types we're using, uh, using single locus or multi-locus uh, uh, tandem repeats. Here's, here's an example, and I just want to point out, this is done from an applied biosystems uh, kit. Um, and this is for human genome, uh, genetic STR profiling. And what we're doing here is we're running our fragments out on something like HPLC. The x-axis indicates the length of the fragments, which would be pretty standard in a specific cell type. And the uh, y-axis in, in indicates the intensity of the signal. I'll also point out that some of these uh, uh, small uh, uh, tandem repeat uh, probes will also identify a uh, male cell uh, with a Y chromosome. Chromosome analysis is also a very good way to analyze whether you have a human or a monkey cell or something like that. Uh, it is difficult but definitive. Uh, what we do there is you would arrest the cells in metaphase somehow, maybe with a drug like Colsimid. You would then drop the slide, the cells onto a microscope slide, and you would analyze um, the chromosome spread. You could use fluorescent uh, probes and identify certain chromosomes, uh, use markers and so forth to identify certain genes on certain chromosomes. Of course, we can count up the number of chromosome pairs. We can look for a Y chromosome uh, in a male. Uh, uh, cell line and so forth. One, I will point out, though, that because we're normally growing cells uh, that are cancerous or somehow different from normal, oftentimes the numbers of chromosomes can vary between uh, in vivo and in vitro. I also want to point out that another good way would be mitochondrial DNA analysis because it is low complex and there is a high level of stability, but then there are also some known variable regions where people can make probes to, uh, and there are several hypervariable regions uh, within the mitochondrial DNA that people um, might, might want to look at. The other one would be self-surface antigens. This would be a good way to detect uh, intra or interspecies cross-contamination, and I guess one of the things I would do would, I would, would be to understand the biology of the cells you're using. Liver cells should have liver proteins in them. Kidney cells should have cell surface antigens on them and so forth. So using monoclonal antibodies prepared against specific cell surface antigens may be a way to determine um, uh, Intra or intraspecies cross contamination because, of course, whether you have a human liver or a human kidney cell, those cells should have the same chromosome uh, analysis and mitochondrial analysis. So, cell surface antigens would be the way to distinguish one cell type from another. Uh, you might also use biochemical assays. 
I hope this has been helpful, um, and thank you for your participation.